theorist who will be coming uh, from Swarthmore College. Uh, but this week, we're very pleased to have uh, I don't know how to set up for next week for that. <laughs> yeah. This week, we have uh, our own Mr. John Sevier, who um, is going to talk to us about some of his work uh, engaging students uh, with problem coding. Thank you, John. Thank you. So, go ahead, go ahead and start. We're going to be looking at how we're going to engage a, pop engage a population that's really disconnected from a lot of college students, uh, really specifically. So you're going to see a lot of data, or not really a lot of data, there's a lot of data to pull from. You're going to see a lot of the highlights. Um, for most of everything I've gone through, uh, it's pretty interesting to see what the students come up with. It's really, really interesting to see how these students are engaging with math curriculum and their own attitudes and beliefs. So the purpose of this, and I've got multiple irons in fire why I wanted to do this study. One, it's been a passion to work with this type of demographic. I worked with the same group at the high school level, freshmen coming in, juniors and seniors, uh, repeaters, if you will, and also students at this level. But my biggest thing for this particular study is I wanted to address how students work with work problems, engage with work problems, because that seems to be the Achilles heel for a lot of our developmental students. They don't know how to break down the work problems, and then once they break down the problems, they don't necessarily have the background to solve the problems. So in order to do that, I had to kind of take a few steps back and try to go, okay, how can I how can I address these work problems? We've done the four-step model for years in development. It is helpful in some ways. Other ways, students are still disengaged. And that's why I keep coming back. The students are not engaged with the material. So biggest thing is, how can we engage them? And when we engage these students and we work with these work problems, why are they being disengaged? Well, a lot of times related, the problems are not relatable to them. They don't ride a train anymore going at so many miles per hour and the train leaves 10 minutes later. They don't get into those type of problems. Uh, distance problems, ratio problems, a lot of those problems are the standard textbook. They don't see a relationship with them. So they choose just to skim through it, take out the numbers, put it sum together, hopefully it gets the right answer. And that's been the experience for three or four years working with these students. So uh, through, during my research, trying to figure out some ways to make it more relatable, I've come across problem posing. And I thought it was really intriguing because they've used it a lot at the elementary and middle school levels to engage those students early with math. Well, why not try it with college? So I started digging a little bit deeper. There's been a few studies at the high school level, very, very few at the college level, and those at the college level have been stronger students, Calc 1 students, pre-calc students, nothing hitting this particular developmental student, the ones that are already coming in lagging in several areas. So the main reason I like the problem posing, I'm trying to personalize these work problems and make them more relatable. I've got 44 students, and I gotta figure out something that's relatable to every single one of them. So instead of me trying to figure out what's relatable to them, <laughs> I'm going to flip the script and have them actually come up with things that they prefer to talk about, things that will engage them. So when we go through the problem pose, you'll see several examples where students are using their own personal interest to self author these problems and bring the numbers along for the ride and hopefully engage enough to understand the concepts within. 
So that's the main point of really my overall question, how do they engage with problem posing? Can these students problem pose? Because the literature says otherwise. The literature says that the students that can problem pose correctly, accurately, are stronger students. Your top 10, top 15% of students. Also, a couple other things, I want to see what type of problems they came up with. Did they use their personal experiences? Did they use their personal interests? If so, how in depth did that go? Did the students write longer problems when they use their personal interests or not? And then kind of a little sidebar, and I figure if I'm collecting data, I will collect something also that's interesting to me. How does that affect their attitudes and beliefs? Because that particular class is very negative about themselves and about math in general. And it's deep-seated from years and years of years of just negative beliefs about themselves, that they can do it, about what a teacher did to them, what a parent said to them, what a friend did, how they were well, all these different things I've heard in class multiple times. How is this problem posing affecting their attitudes and beliefs now that they're able to have more of a say-so in what they do? And ultimately, are they coming out prepared for our case, MAP 1010, MAP 1020, MAP 1025. I want to see if these students are meeting and raising the bar where they should be compared to their peers that are not taking the belt medal. So again, I wanted to see it from the research standpoint, but I also want to see, are these things that we can do to prepare our students here to be successful in those next math courses? So as I mentioned earlier, word problems has been the biggest hurdle for a lot of these students. Most of it's because they've been disengaged. However, word problems have been shown to be very helpful for students. They can motivate them to use critical thinking skills to break down the problem, answer the questions, and so forth, and build problem-solving skills that they can relate effectively to their daily lives. Well, that's all well and good, but if the context of the problem is not engaging to them, not relatable, these last two are not going to happen. They're not going to be motivated. And honestly, the only motivation they're going to have, i got to get a grade to get to the next class. And that's what it's going to boil down to. As an instructor, I always strive to move them beyond getting that grade. There's too much focus on that grade. How can you improve yourself to better yourself in other walks and other ways? So, mention the personalization of it, of these problems. When they are being personal, or when they're being personalized, these students are being more engaged, increased motivation, and also, studies have shown, it spreads across the class. Students, once a few students kind of buy in and start being more engaged, you see it work throughout the class dynamic. And for this class, particularly, a lot of them ride on that, well, I was never good at math, everybody chimes in. Everybody's like, yeah, that's the same way. And it's a gang mentality, so to speak, against wanting to do well because they've been really not been doing well for so long or what they deem as not doing well or not being successful. So it's shown that if they can get some engaged, more will come along because they all see themselves in a similar light. So how I conducted this study? Well, to see if it actually did make any improvements or not, I did a comparison study between two of my courses. So I taught both courses, and August of last semester, I gave a questionnaire, and I'll explain the measures here in a second a little bit more, and ran shop as usual for both courses. I ended up extracting every single word problem out of all the units, and I taught all the word problems at the end. So I can isolate specifically what those students need in their word problems. So that way I can compare, based on word problems alone in instruction, did problem posing affect these outcomes differently than those who didn't get problem posing. So again, there's a lot going on. Questionnaire one, I collected basic attitude belief data. Where do you see yourself? How do you feel about yourself? What do you see about math, etc. Before I started the word problem component, I did a questionnaire too, just to see if them being in developmental affected their attitudes and beliefs towards math and about themselves. And then I did a questionnaire at the end to see if there was a difference after the problem posing and to see if anything changed in the control group based on just getting word problems down. We did a pre-test, post-test, and then I also ran interviews with the problem posing group, my 
intervention group. So I've collected a lot of different data to hopefully address those main points of those questions. So the kind of the demographics I was dealing with, I had 44 students per both classes, 38 and 35 crew, or did the IRB, signed off on the IRB, only 32 and 27 from each course actually were here when they did the demographic questionnaire. So I was only able to base it on 32 and 27. So you're going to see that's an overwhelmingly problem for the data because the samples are so small. So there's not going to be a lot of power with the statistical significance, if any at all, but I'm going to bring up at the end kind of the practical significance for me moving forward and what I can do with the classroom to make things a little bit easier. The most alarming thing from the demographical information were these numbers here. Years since their previous math course. Most students coming in were freshmen, excluding my traditional students, and they were first semester transfers. I only had a single uh, second semester transfer coming. Everybody else was their first semester at Appalachian State. That's alarming. That is alarming, especially with it's 2.3 years, 1.88 years since they've had a math class. Okay? So here's the four questions broken down. The last question I had up there was in two parts, so I went ahead and broke that into two separate questions. So when I'm looking at how they engage, I'm gonna bring it, I took up every bit of their work, and I put it in a matrix form. You'll see an example of the matrix, and I also based it out on interviews, and I also did a reflective journal every single day. What type of problems they create? Um, the main focus was gonna be on talking to them through the interviews, bringing out their student work. Why did you create this problem? but also looking at the matrix and looking at a post-test. I had them actually create a question on the post-test. If you wanted to put an exam question or replace it as a word problem, what would you do? How would you bring one in? I had them offer one. If attitudes and beliefs, every bit of that came from the questionnaires, questionnaire one, two, and three, and then the interviews, I asked them, what's your attitude towards math? What's your belief that you can do in math? What, what can you do? How do you, where do you see yourself? Would that ever change, etc.? And then lastly, proficiency, pre-test, post-test, and also ask through interview, do you feel like you're more prepared? Do you feel like you would be successful in that next math course, depending on which way they went, and STEM or not STEM? So problem posing has its own built-in, so to speak, scaffolding, where you start out at a structured level of posing, where most of the things that they're going to need are given, okay? Then we release some of the scaffolding and they go what we call semi-structure, where this is where they start integrating more of their own personal touch. But there's still enough parameters around the problems, there's still enough substance there that they can feel somewhat comfortable with moving forward. And then lastly, free posing is where all scaffolding is released and it's okay, you create a problem based on context or an equation. That was, one of the hardest things for these students initially, but one of the most rewarding things as a researcher to see what they actually did. So what I ended up doing, I dug into the research a little bit. Structured and semi-structured, for the most part, were pretty consistent across the literature. Free and free plus. So free, I saw two different camps kind of start developing. One, with the free, is a little bit, bit different based on what's given. So, with structured, here's an example of a word problem. I give an example. All I'm looking at the student to do is, instead of a student, put your name. Emily has a jar of coins, con or containing a jar of coins, 65 coins, etc. Something as simple as putting their name in, or a parent name, whatever they want to put in. Now, it doesn't seem like that's that big of a deal. But that is the first step into the remaining steps of getting them to engage and actually personalize it. They, we need to start them out very, very slowly because none of the students have ever written a word problem coming into class. So we're asking these students to do something completely different. Everything's always been given to them. Everything's always been written for them. This is the first time they actually have to write something. So we're starting off really basic. A lot of the high school and college students started at this level, ironically, elementary and middle schools started semi-structured and free, which I thought was interesting. Semi-structured, you notice I'm taking away a lot of the content, the context here, 
and say, okay, here's two statements. And notice these are the same statements that you would pull from this. So you have your numerical statements, creates many problems using personal interest, but you still keep the same context. So for instance, you're dealing with currency or you're dealing with distance or you're dealing with another context of problems that we're dealing with. Free, where we kind of split things up, here I give you the statement, make a problem. You don't tell them it's dealing with currency, you don't tell them it's dealing with markup, markup. you don't tell them it's dealing with distance, make a problem. So that was one half of it. The other half is, and this is where I made it free plus because I thought this would be interesting to see what type of problems they come up with without me giving any numbers that they know will work. So the free plus is what I call create a markup markdown problem, create a currency problem. They have to develop their own numerical statements, their own values, their own quantities that have to be valid. So that makes them dig in a little bit more. So that's why I thought about this being free plus, because it, to me, this is asking more of the student in this case. They have to come up with their own numbers. Okay, so in addition to that, the levels of posing, through the pilot study I ran last summer, I ended up categorizing the type of problems those students came up with. And you'll, again, you'll see a mat the matrix here, and when I create the matrix, if it's green, the problem is deemed green, if you will, the student used personalized information that was in the questionnaire, written personalized information. So if they're interested in dogs, if you will, they utilize dogs in the problem. That was part of the subject matter. Okay, uh, Yellow, they didn't write the interest, but through the reflection journal and the observation in class, so they kept on saying, well, I love Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones is the best show ever. Then all of a sudden, Game of Thrones shows up in their problems, even though none of that was written in their questionnaires. So I had to be really careful about what is deemed personalized interest, and it ended up turning into two different categories. And I took a lot of in-depth notes, recorded a lot of student conversation, just to make sure those students had those personal interests that I was hearing. Not personalized they created a problem based on the journal, based on the questionnaires, the subject matter had nothing pertaining to what was written or what was stated. Mimicked, they looked at my problem, they copied it word for word. John has so many coins, but then you saw that same thing come up and it's John had so many coins, so they essentially copied and mimicked. Original, not given an option of personalization, to help build these students in, I had them write numerical statements, which it was hard to do a personalization of a numerical statement. Literally, here's a numerical statement, put it in words, utilize various words. So you see a lot of the first problems are very orange, if you will, but then you see more colors come in as we get in more depth. And then purple, they didn't turn it in. They just decided they didn't turn it in or they didn't do it. They never returned it. Okay, here's an example of the pilot study. This is based on nine students over five days. I did this study for 30, in this case it was 31, 31 students over 24 days. So the matrix was extremely large, extremely large. Actually, I can bring that up. No, I don't because I don't have with me, never mind. So, a lot of different things are going on, a lot of different pieces going on, but it gives me a sense of, okay, looking at these problems here, there was a lot of mimicking, there was a lot of original problems, there was a lot of personalization. More written in a shorter period than I saw in a longer period. So to give you an idea of what occurred this fall, we had 83 total written personalized problems turned in. 231 non-personalized, 136, or excuse me, yellow personalized, 136 non-personalized, 47 mimicked, which I was really pleased with that. Most students were trying to at least try something. Original, you saw, I saw a large number of this. That was expected, but very early on, I saw a lot of problems that did not have a personalization component with it. And then purple, 1,010 did not come back. I expected a little less than that, but then as I was reflecting, we missed 
several days. Thanksgiving was in that little period. So future research is not going to be done in the month of November in Boone or January for that matter. So that was something I'm learning quickly. But with that aside, these top three were the most interesting, especially the yellow, something I didn't foresee. I mean, we see a return rate for students, 6.6 problems based on students coming back. Now, based on the various levels, this was one problem assigned, 15 problems assigned, 27, 10, total of 53 total problems were assigned. Had 14 students return a structured problem, 270 students, or excuse me, 270 problems were returned, 442, 143. I expected more students to do free posing, but it actually turned out more students returned semi-structured. Didn't see that as a big deal, but as I dug into the interviews and talked to some of the students in class, they liked that additional structure. They liked knowing, one, the numbers are there, they're giving me the context, I can, I can make the most elaborate problem around what you've already got for me. And a lot of that was a safety net. A lot of that was I don't want to make a mistake, I don't want to fail. It went back to that attitude and beliefs where I have failed so much at math. I'm okay moving beyond structured. I'm going to go on a limb and try semi-structured. Free and free plus make me slightly nervous. Uh, free plus more or less because that's where they had to come up with their own numbers. We saw more with free, a lot of them just tried it. And you'll see some examples here in a second where some tried it were very successful, so I'm not so much. For example, here's an example of a semi-structured problem. Here's what I gave, pose and write problems based on the following ratios that relate to either dividing a sum of money or population. So they're given the ratio, they're given the context, and this was a good one, John, yeah, beat me, gave out five <laughs> word problems for every six standard problems. Test has 120 questions, how many of those were word problems? So, not bad, not bad. Again, this was one of the kind of entry level problems, one of the first groups, the first units that had them do some personalization. Unlike any other, the only thing that I found this one very lacking, they did not solve it. I asked them to try to solve every single one. I found out that 74% of the problems that returned were not solved, but they at least wrote them. And we'll see some examples, and most of the semi-structures were not solved. I saw more coming from these, this particular unit in Free and Free Plus. So here's another one. This is one that was actually uh, done closer to the end. And this also became a very emerging theme of money. That was one theme that came out. If I had any example about money, more students drove back to those examples and posed more of those problems than anything else. They're all the interviews, and I figured as much, I got a little taste of that from the pilot over the summer, but I didn't think it was that apparent and that in depth, but students found that the most relatable when they dealt with money. Here's a free problem. Create as many word problems as you can based on the following proportion. So we're still within that ratio unit, get them to understand comparison that we built from um, not proportion, but ratio, but we built a proportion from this. So here the student used two people, but they also solved it out. So from this point, I thought, well, I was wanting them to set up a proportion to compare <coughs> between two ratios compared to this, but they at least gave me something that shows that they understand what how to solve the problem. Give me a little bit of insight of, okay, they, they at least have an idea, and more importantly, and remember, ratios were taught numerically wise, not word problem wise, back in August. So the student was recalling in November what they did in August. We didn't review any additional math content, we just dove right to the word problems. Here's a free plus. These were very intriguing. This, and by the way, all of these coming up are non STEM students. These are problems built from non-STEM students. So we have a student here, student 132, came up with a problem. 
scenario was two equations, two unknowns. Did a really good job of trying to find quantities based on number of seats and ticket sales. But if you saw this out, you would have to sell negative 16 seats for one group and not for the other. So, and the reason I wanted to put this one up, I put this in front of everybody and asked, okay, how many of you like this problem? Everybody so looked at it and thought it was a long problem. So all the hands went up. I said, well, what's wrong with it? And, then, and I didn't tell him who did it, but still, kind of, you could tell him he started turning a little red. But he came up with the solution himself. He said, well, this can't work because of this many items. And then that one kid said, well, I didn't see that. So this was what was really cool. Once we jumped into this, the class conversation took off. I just said, well, what do y'all think? It was 15 minutes of conversation about, okay, how could we create this problem better? How can we improve it? What do I need to know in order to make sure my quantities are correct? I got a little piece of that from the uh, pilot study with markup markdown where a young lady said, well, I can't buy a negative 15 shirts. So obviously I did something wrong. So the problem solving started coming out through the student conversation. Now again, that mentality of, okay, now we're all on the same page, we can help each other. You saw across the room and the problems improve from that conversation, which was really neat. The other one, he looked at it after going through this, and he said, yeah, don't even bring this one up. He said, don't even bring this one up because it's got a lot of problems, and I'll tell you right now where they were going, where I went wrong. But to me, for a student to have that reflection about, okay, I know what I did wrong, I know how to improve it, for a developmental math student, spoke volumes. Where at that, earlier in that semester, he just wanted the answer. He could care less about anything else. I just need to get the answer so I can move on, be a history teacher at the high school. That's all he cared about. That's all he wanted to do. And that, and you can, some of his other problems, you saw a lot more of that subject matter come through, which is really cool. Okay? I know you can't read this, so I did this for you. <laughs> it's still kind of hard to see this, but I wanted to bring up their work more or less than the problem they created. Um, this young lady is going to be an elementary teacher. So you saw a lot of her subject matter talking about kids, fundraisers, bake sales. Um, when we did proportions and ratios, she talked about population of her classes, guys to girls, and break up the schools, which was really neat. So we talked about this one in class, and this was a prime example where I just mentioned where I can't have negative 110 shirts. And there's that wonderful question mark. So she's already gone above me on trying to solve the problem. But the question mark, when she came up and said, so I solved this. I have a solution. So for one, the student created a solution. That's, that's great. But why, why are we getting a negative value? So I said, well, ask your neighbor. They were start talking again. It, it just bloomed. She said right there, and it bloomed out. I said, Can we put this up on the board? So I broke out the Elmo, put it up on the board, and we start talking through it again. And suddenly so says, "Well, if you increase this number, or you decrease the price for this one, increase the price for this one, and you increase the quantity, total quantity, this affects." And they start using that word. And I thought, "Oh, thank you, thank you. This is nice. This affects this quantity. It needs to balance here." That kind of stuff I typically don't hear at the developmental class. Typically here maybe in my business calc class or calc one. Once again, same student, another thing, they need to write in pen. <laughs> Pencil's not great. However, so this was about two days later. So kind of give you the timeline. Two days later, she worked everything out, but she only, we had a total of 10 pounds. She said eight and one pound. Eight pounds of one item, one pound of the other. I said, so I thought you were doing 10 pounds. Well, I got a decimal, and I didn't know what to do with the decimal. So here's what I did. I knew if I did too much of one, I'd go over $15. That's my limit. I have $15. So I know I can buy eight of this and one of that, and I'm under my budget. That's really good, that's intriguing. So how could you address this, how could you fix this? How could you address it based on rounding? Don't change anything else, but how could you round it differently? And then again, class conversation started happening. On our lab days, Tuesdays and Thursdays, we'd have the conversation where 
what can we do? How can we improve? And this was one of the items where we had a class conversation. Okay, what can we do? What? How does rounding affect this final answer? How does rounding affect this problem? Do we have to go back and rewrite this whole thing? Some said yes, some said no. So, okay, make it better. A lot of them could come up with anything really better, but they also start self-reflecting, well, if I can't write this, I don't know the structure of this problem. I don't understand what the end goal is. So a lot of it was the conversation that came from the different posing. A lot of it came from, now that I know I'm not the only one struggling, everybody knew that I struggled. Everybody struggled in here. Because at first they said, who's ever struggled in math? I keep my hand up with it. I struggled at one point or another. They all struggled. So we all know we've struggled at some point. But now that they see success happen from their colleagues, well, if they can succeed, why can't I not succeed? So again, it's kind of advantageous where they start feeling a little bit more positive about it. So pre-test, post-test. I'm not going to get into a lot of detail with attitudes and beliefs because that's a whole other hour in itself. And you kind of got the highlights within the different types of problems. So pre-test and post-test. Here's the pre-test on word problems. My control, my intervention. 58, we'll say 59. We'll round it up. And a 44. Post-test. We see both of them increase rather well, which we should. We isolated that unit and we dug in heavily on that unit. But what I found interesting was course B had a bigger jump. Now, they had more room to grow, but they had a bigger jump. 63% changes accordingly to the other, only 53. Now, again, does that mean that they're comparable to their peers? Yet to be determined. We're still digging in on that a little bit more. But this is a good indication from a practitioner standpoint. One thing I looked at was the standard deviation was a lot smaller. There were four students in the control that did worse than their pretest. Everybody in intervention improved. That was interesting. And also the fact that they were more clustered around their improvement. For me, it made me feel like, well, maybe I can do better predicting where they should be. And I can address the needs from as far as that prediction is concerned. But then I thought, I need to break this down a little bit more. So I broke it up into thirds. And I thought, well, typically this class, I've got some students that probably could go into 10, 10, 10, 20, 10, 25, and be successful. Not maybe an A, maybe an A, but could get by. Then I got some that are kind of riding the fence, so to speak, and then you got those who need to be in here. So, course A, my control group. Course B, intervention. So we see even the high group, the pretest, does not compare to the high group of the pretest of my control. But we see the change a lot higher for all three of these lowers. And then when I compare them and stack them, okay, who did better based on percent growth? We have the middle B, which I figured would be the low B, but the middle group in my intervention had a higher jump. Next came my lowest group in the intervention. The low group in the control, then the high group in the intervention, then the other two from control. So as, as I move forward to the summer and fall, it's going to make me focus a little bit more one on this middle group. But also, problem posing did have an effect. Again, I told you at the very beginning, small sample size, it's going to hard to really make it statistically significant. So, need a larger sample, obviously, but practical significance wise, there was an effect there. It may be very minor, but ultimately, the students felt like they were improving. The students felt like they were preparing themselves for the next course. And I had more students from Group B from my intervention at the end of the semester said, I feel ready to go into 1010. I feel ready to go into 1020, which is the majority of where they went was 1010 and 1020. I didn't hear it as abundant from Group A, which was interesting. And I asked them as a class and asked them individually, had more people from Group B verbally come out and say in front of everybody, I'm ready to go, I, can, I think I'll do well. Group A, they were still hesitant, which was 
Again, I taught them the same way throughout the whole semester. The only thing was different was that word problem section. So, kind of things we can I could take from this. One, the developmental students can problem post. The literature says otherwise. This shows that they can. Now, can we improve on it? Can I improve as an instructor how to utilize problem posing better? Absolutely. I will start from day one, August, and work all the way through the semester. That scaffolding of them posing their own problems needs to be done better than in a 24-day period. They need more time to use, get used to it, do what they need to do to kind of prepare themselves for it. Then when we get into more rigorous stuff, they have that foundation of how to create my own problem. Some more problem solving skills emerged when they were problem posing. They were talking amongst themselves. They were, they were trying to outdo each other. They had a competition. I can write a better problem than you can. My, my numbers are right. Yours is wrong. I mean, things like that. Healthy, healthy competition, but they were engaged. They were trying to solve. They were trying to figure it out. And then one thing that actually was a blessing, we did markup and markdown right before Black Friday. It was planned, but so how can I get them engaged? But they started thinking, well, and one of them brought out a sales flyer. I thought they'd look up their phone. They brought out the paper and said, okay, I can go to Target. I can do this. This is a markup. They started breaking it down what they could do based on their budget. That's wonderful. And again, additional scaffolding is needed. Main topics that emerged, the type of problems they posed, money was the top one. Even when I didn't give them a context of money. Problems I didn't do in class with money. They created money problems. Those were the things that were engaging. They, I found a lot more students bring me a family. Sisters, brothers, aunts, uncles, dogs. I can't tell you how many animal pet names got brought into the problem buying products. Even in there, I said, who's Sam? Sam's my cat. So Sam's buying a CD player. They said, are you arguing? Absolutely not. Hey, whatever works. You're writing the problem. You're getting it correct. Who am I to judge? And then the immediate interest. I found their interest for college students had changed from August to November, especially all these first semester college students. That's understood. And I also found a lot of them situational. A lot of students that wrote down their interests on the questionnaire one was pertaining to summer interests. I had a lot more surfing, beach, uh, kayaking, canoeing, camping, that sort of thing. And I asked a couple of students, well, why didn't you use it, utilize any of that? Well, I'm not gonna talk about that kind of stuff around Christmas, especially in moon. You wanna go camping out in 33 degrees? We just missed two days because of snow. Okay, I get it. So if you were in the spring semester, they said absolutely. I would have done more problems pertaining to that. So a lot of it was based on time of year. And then again, we talked about practical significance with proficiency. Again, sample size is small. A little bit of problem with power on that. But as an instructor, I can see there was an effect there. Stronger effect, better sample size can help dictate that. So. Questions, comments, concerns for me? Yes, sir. Something, uh, early article that was referred to me was pointed out in the 2014 article. Uh, they used the term deep level context. Yes. Did you find the deep level context what seemed to produce the most meaningful, or I'm forgetting the exact way that the word phrase was used. So the deep level context was meant in two different situations. One, the elaborate, or the, the depth of which the problem was created, for instance, the student was more left with their story. Instead of saying, John bought six items, you need to buy three more, how many will we buy total? They actually create more of a story. So the deep context was pertaining to that, but also the understanding of the problem itself. So most of the literature says you got that surface level understanding, I see what I've got to do, I'm going to do it, and move on. The deeper level understanding is, now that I can write this problem, do I understand the math behind it? One, to create a reasonable problem, and two, have a valid solution. So it's serving two purposes. There. Did you get a sense that, did you confirm that with your students? Only after the students' conversations started happening. From their work, I had trouble still because it was haphazard. So one day a student would have been a high flyer, writing problems, I could have put on a test. But literally the next day, it's like they took three steps back. And it was the same material. So I don't know what happened over the weekend or what happened the next day, what happened in the different examples, but from the conversation, I got more of the better understanding because they start bringing in things from, again, August, September, October, 
Oh, we did this at this unit, so therefore we can apply it here. We can use it here. 